This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is Thursday noontime, folks. Uh, Ted Ralston here in our Think Tech studios downtown, overlooking probably Kahana Bay at this point in time, uh, with our show where the drone leads, talking about drone subjects uh, and bringing more than that interesting people into the studio. And today we have sort of the top of the pyramid of interesting people category. We have all the way from the Marshall Islands, we have Scott Paul, who is the city manager of Kwajalein Atoll and all the islands contained and the waters contained within. And you've been on twice now, I think, uh, Scott. Uh, yes. Did to become a frequent flyer here <laughs> uh, as we connect Hawaii and Marshall Islands. Well, and, uh, we try. We try. <laughs> okay. Now, there's some guys who aren't here. There's some other folks in town. The mayor's here. Mayor Kabua is yes. uh, uh, taking care of other things right now. <clears throat> and we don't have uh, Joel and uh, Jane with us. Uh, he is apparently somewhere else. Uh, he couldn't make the flight. Couldn't make the flight. Okay. Yes. Well. Jeldon, we're uh, missing you. I uh, wish you were here. Uh, and too bad, Jeldon, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, of course, we have the originator of so many grand thoughts, uh, Greg Nakano. <clears throat> Greg, thanks for coming on board. Also a frequent flyer. Thank you. And a dangerous partner to have in things that uh, <laughs> could go a long way. But uh, Greg is um, notionally a uh, former Marine, a uh, present thinker, uh, current student at University of Hawaii. Yes, sir. And uh, originator, leader, and promoter of Pacific Allies. And so all those subjects get back to drones somehow. Right. So why don't you take the lead on that, Greg, and, and let's see how that all ties back together okay. again. And we'll bring in some very recent reasons that Scott's here and bring that into the conversation. I think this probably mm -hmm. goes back to the first time we met, and it's got to be five, at least five, six years at ago. At least, yeah. <laughs> and... And this was right before, I think, you went to the Philippines. So you were going to the Philippines and almost immediately after that with, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Chuck Devaney. Chuck Devaney. And you began using drones with students to do civilian applications. And about that same time, I was looking at how do we build programs that are going to help students, cadets, and midshipmen understand the climate change impacts on national security. The things they'll face in real life on right. their officers that they probably won't get through the curriculum in their academies. Right. So okay. real yeah. life. <laughs> and speaking of real life. <laughs> That's right. And, and so I think it was two and a half years ago. Yes. I uh, had a chance to, I, I actually barged in on his office, kind of cold call, knocked on the door, and, you know, sort of pitched this crazy idea okay, we, we're going to try and bring students, cadets, and midshipmen to look at climate change impacts on national security, but we'd like to do it in Ebi City and Kwajalein Atoll. And that's where Scott, Scott comes in. Mm -hmm. and, and that area is not an unfragile area. You guys are facing some serious future consequences, Scott. Yes, yes. That and is you are true. city manager. Yes. Therefore, you're sort of responsible, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Basically, uh, basically put, yeah, I'm responsible for that. And um, as uh, as Greg mentioned, this all happened two and a half years ago when this crazy guy <laughs> came and knocked on my door and said, "Hey, I want to do something with you with the local government in the city of Ewai." Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was like a it was a blind obe blind obedience or <laughs> I don't know, blind, blind leading the blind blind leading the blind. <laughs> But uh, eventually, this all paid off. We managed to establish uh, a working Pacific Allies program, which we're almost at the, with the, uh, at the stage that we're going to make it more of an, of an official, of an official uh, endeavor with the local government passing a, a resolution making it an official program for the local government. That's fantastic. Yes. So the, 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 your local government, anybody in Kwajalein, yes. has taken this on, seen the value, and gone through the paperwork of generating a charter or a recommendation mm -hmm. or a salutation or something yes. to get a high level of recognition here. Yes. We've got to bring that story to our legislature here. Oh, okay. And you met somebody yesterday who's... Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> we met this... <laughs> The governor of the state of Hawaii, and that was very honoring for us. The mayor 
was here. He made a uh, courtesy courtesy visit to the, uh, the governor, and uh, it was a really well placed visit, and uh, we really appreciate appreciated that. And I think with that established, we can do more from there. And uh, I mean, given that Hawaii spends fifteen million dollars on COPA students alone every year, and then nine percent increasing every year. Uh, that actually gives us the motivation to see how we can um, better prepare our kids for the future, for them to migrate and then not just be a burden on the social welfare uh, uh, in, in Hawaii, rather. In, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come prepared. Come prepared. There you go. Uh, and becoming contributing uh, citizens in the future. And what that, that's, uh, that's a really incredible thought you had because what you're suggesting is that there's going to have to be out migration mm -hmm. from the threatened areas uh, as sea level rise occurs. It is inevitable. It is inevitable because climate change has always been here. It's just that we're experiencing it in a, the, the, new, the new world is really experiencing it at an expensable amount of that. It really affects the way of life and everything. Our water lenses will be more brackish than they, they are right now. Vegetation won't grow, and it will be inhabitable to the point that I believe it's uh, 50 to 60 years. They might be underwater, might be, but we're just preparing the kids for the future and bringing all these technology, how we can in, uh, integrate them into our uh, traditional way of life through STEM, that's another thing, because I believe that's the best way that the children can learn. Because us islanders, we're all, vo we were voyagers. We were peace seekers, as uh, uh, Hono Shin mentioned. And instead of the using the word uh, Refugee refugees, or, yeah. migrants, we were, we, and still are, Voyagers, navigators, and it's, it's still in our blood. So why don't we take out that uh, labeling that we put on upon ourselves by saying, well, they're Micronesians, they're Polynesians, they're Melanesians, and just use one word as islanders, because we are all islanders at one point. We were used to be that, just islanders, instead of these other labels that the others brought upon us, bestowed upon us later on. So with that said, I believe if we can be under one voice using the name Islanders, we can have our message more powerful than it is right now. And a, a great place to attach that message is to Pacific Allies. Yes. Because that is a place that has the, all, at, the at this point in time, the government uh, recognition and through Greg's work, uh, Pacific Command's attention <coughs> and uh, university's attention, so there's a lot of value that that has as a mixing box, as an intermediary connecting all, and it's one thing. It's the Pacific, and it's the alliances that are across the Pacific that make it work. But I, going back for a moment, uh, Scott, to what you said about the emerging measurable effects of sea level rise mm -hmm. and, and such, we are seeing that a little bit here, not as extremely as you're seeing it, but we have the king tides, they call them now and then, which mm -hmm. require sandbags on Waikiki. We have uh, uh, erosion along the beaches in a, in a big way, but we're beginning to see it. But I don't think anybody other than landowners who've had their, had their property go into the ocean have, we haven't felt it, I think, in a, in a broad way here where it's affected everybody. We don't have brackish water. We don't have a lot of the effects that you are already seeing. Mm -hmm. So people who are in, in the young adult age group will have seen a change from when they were kids to what they're seeing now. Is that, in, in fact, going on, that awareness? Yes, and uh, it's, uh, there's visual evidence because there are, the, there are times that when king, died, king tide season comes in, you literally have an island split in two. One island that used to be whole is split in two because of uh, king tides and erosions. And uh, that is something that we, that is evidence that uh, 
climate change is there for people that do not know what climate, climate change is. And uh, it is very unfortunate that some think that, think that climate change is just uh, uh, something, that, just an excuse, but it is really there. And we live it every day. That, that's the part that sets us apart from where you are mm -hmm. leading the way, so to speak, into this future. <clears throat> Does that suggest that maybe some kind of a Pacific Allies-oriented climate change awareness session or physical reality session could be held on Dubai or yes. in the Kwajalein Atoll in some way? Yeah, and uh, maybe, Greg, can you uh, elaborate more on that? <laughs> That was a setup, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the things that, I mean, you're a paddler and, you know, we're talking canoes and everyone, in, you know, in the same direction. More and more I'm figuring out you can't build any system on your own resources alone. And everyone is bringing something different to the table. So when we started the, the concept of bringing Western students, you know, students, American students from the mainland or from Hawaii down to Kwajalein and looking at the climate change impacts, it really was for the benefit of the American students. It was to give them a preview of what they reasonably could anticipate in Florida, California, Texas, Hawaii in 40 or 50 years when they're in, you know, when they're in leadership positions. But after being there the first year, what we realized was there was an enormous need and opportunity to be working with the Marshallese youth to actually help them get a vision for what they would do with their lives when the islands no longer could sustain them. And so over the, even over two, only two years of doing the Pacific Ally program, what we've done is we've slowly shifted from just trying to prep mm -hmm. American students to actually building a collaborative process with the local administrators and students on the island and the service academies, West, um, West Point, Coast Guard Academy, Naval Academy, and University of Hawaii. So that's a partnership. We're learning from them because they're the ones experiencing the cha challenges. And they're also getting a chance to look at where they might go. Why not go to the University of Hawaii? It's, you know, top 10 schools in the nation for oceanography. Why not try and go to Coast Guard Academy? There's actually an open seat for any Marshallese who wants to attend the Coast Guard mm -hmm. Academy. So there are opportunities, and if you don't know where there are. A lot comes to mind from what you just said, and, and again, every time we meet different major inspirational themes pop up from the two of you. And let me get back to the that preparation for the future, the idea you just brought up that is now not just us as U.S. preparing to see what we're going to see and how we're going to deal with it, but working with the folks who are affected more directly right. than we are and what they're going to do. And the fact that they are being challenged, being asked, being suggested to think about a future that they have no context for because right. they haven't ever been displaced before. Mm -hmm. This is something this is a major social effect on your, on your whole persona. So let's get back to that uh, after we take our break. Back in one minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. If you're not in control of how you see yourself, then who is? Live above the influence. You can be the greatest, you can be the best. You can be the king, come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. You could talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Stand in the hall of fame. It is still the noon hour uh, Thursday, folks. Uh, Scott Paul, from uh, the city manager from Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands, uh, and uh, Greg Nakano, University of Hawaii, and a lot of other things here with us uh, on the show where the drone leads. We talked about drones at the very beginning, and we're going to get back to drones in a minute here, but we had a 
really incredible 15-minute discussion prior to the break on preparation for massive cultural change, physical change, location change that you're facing and that we're going to face a bit later on. The, you would call you the canary in a coal mine, uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> if that sticks. So anyway, uh, what, what I was uh, intrigued by was how those frames of reference that are needed to handle that kind of coming change can be addressed at, at least from an information exchange basis through the world of STEM, mm -hmm. I think, to a large extent. Uh, STEM is cultural agnostic. It is language agnostic. It is what it is. And it's similar to mathematics. Mathematics is the same whether you uh, find it in a French textbook, a German textbook, or a, an English textbook. The, te the narrative may be different, mm -hmm. but the thought process is essentially the same, and the expression in equation form and such is identical. Mm -hmm. So there's some commonality here that, as in the case of math, that, that really can connect the world uh, through STEM and through the the, 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 think, the thought process and the self-preparation that goes along with becoming involved in STEM. And I think there's no reason that eBuy can't be right up there with anybody else as a member of that worldwide community and use that as a transfer mechanism to communicate, to exchange ideas, and, take, and use that as part of the preparation in two ways. One, for the island itself, mm -hmm. as we discover what uh, undersea factors might be, agricultural and such, and, as you said, in getting ready, for the big word, ex-migration to mm -hmm. some other place because it's going to have to happen at some point in time. So that's just some thoughts I had on how this does get back to drones and gets back to, and with drones, I have to know it to be airplane type drones. Right. We're talking mm -hmm. about surface and subsurface drones, basically information collection devices, yes. but in, incredibly dependent upon emerging technology, and that is where the common denominator is that links us all together. I, I was going to say, I think that's exactly what science is trying to do. It's like in the conversation we had earlier, you were talking about how a mathematical equation or a, a scientific experiment is run in different languages, and yet when it's written out in the formula, the inputs and the outputs should be the same if it's true science. I think that's where we have a huge opportunity is that whether it's in the Marshall Islands or in Hawaii or in some lab, you know, Lincoln Lab or Scandia Lab. Sure, in Hawaii it was called like Ahupua or in Japan, Satoyama. And then you come to the new terminology today and you might get something like homeostatic ecosystem sustainability. But the concept... You got some of that? <laughs> yeah. but, but the concepts were the same. It's that inputs, outputs, circular relationships, and how you have nonlinear relationships that us as humans are really dependent on. And we had a really great conversation with Pono Shim yesterday, and thank you, Pono, for you know, taking the time. But he was saying, it's, we have to move away from transactional thinking, from linear transactional quid pro quo, and look into interdependent relational discussions and that's where we went back to, I think, what Scott was talking about earlier, is that if you think about the Micronesians or Marshallese or Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and how they were able to finely tune the way they lived in harmony with the seasons, the tides, the productivity of the land, to such a degree that they were able to survive, despite, they, they still had tsunamis come through, they still had typhoons come through, and somehow they were able to live there because they understood the natural science of where they were living so well. And so I think that's what we're trying to do is figure out how do we take that native traditional knowledge that may not be in that scientific equation yet, but then use the data that is coming from drones, that is, com that is coming from satellites or remotely operated vehicles to verify what the ancient leaders and elders and knowledge keepers, they knew, mm -hmm. different language, but they just didn't have it in numbers. And I think that's where the opportunity is. And so um, that leads to the challenge then of how do we identify, collect, and, and characterize that form of wisdom, that form of uh, knowledge, that form of readiness and such. In fact, uh, 
that's exactly, I like your, your notion of the uh, transactional relationships. Mathematical equations are purely that, transactional relationships. One thing begets the other, and they're really tightly bound by how they're, how they're uh, defined. But what's missing in all that is that state change above to where the, the human factors and the, the uh, intelligence and the motivations are represented. So I don't know where we have a way to describe that in the, in the scientific domain. As you point out, uh, a successfully managed ahupua'a would have had some of that in its, in its DNA. A successfully managed isolated community would have had that in its DNA. So extracting that and coming up with what the roots are that make that all work would be fascinating. And we had the conversation that we were all in yesterday down mm -hmm. at the uh, convention center, thanks to Debbie Zimmerman and others who put that on. And that was right. all about, I can't quite remember the name, Sockness. Sockness. Sockness, yeah. Sockness. which I had never heard of. I don't think you had heard no. of. I don't know if you time. had heard of. Yeah. But we. What, what were your thoughts on that? SACNES, that was an incredible ability, a, a, a outreach to bring people together across cultural boundaries using STEM as that common denominator, that vehicle of information transfer. I, I think one of the, it's an amazing endeavor, and I, I think they said they've been in business 45 40 years? or 50, almost 50 40, years. Yeah, yeah, almost 50 years. Um, and it was, as I understand it, it was to look at how can the group empower Native American, Chicano, Hispanic students to become leaders in science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And then it, but it was a blending of cultural traditions in such a way that they began to see the value of the old legends and myths and how those actually followed modern science and the knowledge that we're get, gathering today. And so when I thought, okay, if this is an opportunity for whether it's Marshallese or Micronesian kids to fly drones, to use LIDAR to now penetrate underneath the water and begin watching changes in salinity or current flows and things like that. I mean. That would be such a neat thing. And the fact that it's going to be in Hawaii, uh, I think, what was it, October 31st to 2 November of next year, that's, it just gives us an opportunity to really showcase the scientific value of the local traditional knowledge in ways that probably has never been imagined before. Mm. Yes, and uh, uh, Greg, I'm glad you mentioned that, Greg, because uh, one thing that Pono made me realize is that um, culture is a blend of all the disciplines itself, and that's how people, our people, were able to um, survive on just coconuts, <laughs> <laughs> breadfruit, fish, all these years, for hundreds of years. I mean, if you were looking for that missing factor, I think that's the link between uh, science and mathematics and all these things this culture which is rooted into the people, into the DNA. And uh, because culture, our islands, they're our identity. And that's why I believe that's how we were able to survive for hundreds of years in these sandbars that we live on. And, and that, I think, was what I was sensing also in this meeting yesterday as I heard about Sucknus for the first time and began to understand what it was all about and see the value. While we can get good at the transactional work, which we have to do, that's the basis of communication. But the insight that falls from that is what is where the value ultimately is. You still need that transactional capability to be a participant, but gaining the insight, and, and again, guys like Kalani Souza have some of that. Uh, uh, you mentioned Pono. There's a lot of folks who can contribute to that, uh, that pool of knowledge. And then we have to capture that in its own frame of reference of what it, and bottle it somehow mm -hmm. and uh, use it as the transfer agent that, that allows people to move from one cultural domain to the other yes. uh, on that with the common denominator of communication through STEM as the connective mm -hmm. element. In fact, I was sitting here some of the, hearing some of the conversation yesterday just thinking back to my own childhood and uh, you know, being raised here, you kind of think island way and then you go off to the mainland and go to college or something and go off to work and, 
and you find, hey, these guys think the same way I think, even though <laughs> they have nothing, that, they have no knowledge of mm -hmm. Kauinui Marsh and Kailua or anything like that, they still think the same way. Right. So I feel connected now to the rest of the world because my thought process matches their thought process. And so we have a, may not agree, but we have a frame of understanding each other right. anyway. So I was really uh, struck by that. And I think that's a great value of suckness and I wish we had uh, known about it before. So we got to figure a way to get some folks from the islands up here uh, in October of next year. I'm sure that will happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that will happen because the mayor has a uh, committed to a lot of things so uh, then uh, in regards to education especially when it's uh, about preparing the kids for the future so I believe I believe Jeldon will be coming back soon okay Jeldon are you there <laughs> at your own expense yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he controls the first ring <laughs> he's city manager Jeldon <laughs> So, but when getting back to drones again and, and STEM, if you throw any element of STEM on the table or any element, especially drones or especially the airplane versions of drones, a kid with any cultural background, it doesn't matter what their cultural background is. It doesn't matter whether they've been trained in science or trained in, in linguistics or what their training has been. They are gonna sort of commonly uh, be attracted to that functionality, that capability, and they'll do something with it in their own way. So, uh, I think that there is always a point for right. drones in here as a that focal point. And mm -hmm. if anything ever began to flag, just throw some drones in, and you'll re-energize the whole office. And, and to me, I think you know the the most exciting piece of this is how do we transform the military industrial complex into the human security network? And if you look at GPS, which everyone uses now. If I'm not mistaken, it originally was designed so that a submarine was able to fire a nuclear ballistic missile and hit its target. As long as it was top secret, it wasn't able to help mom or dad or you know Uncle John find his way to Safeway on the other side of the island. And yet once it entered the civilian domain, there was such richness in what was able to be accomplished. Same thing with drones. For the first five or ten years, it was used in Afghanistan or in all these wars to deliver Hellfire missiles and blow up, you know, terrorists. But once we're able to put it back in the hands of children and the next generation, hopefully we're going to be able to use the same technology that was originally designed for a strictly military destructive purpose for actually understanding our environment better and beginning to help them craft a way forward. Let's, uh, let's finish with one, in the last minute we have here, with one challenge we can raise on, on our good friend Scott. And we'll help you with the challenge, by okay. the way. So it's okay. not just a, a burden you have to bear. Right. But we <laughs> should think of eBay as being perhaps the most threatened of all the nations that are going to be represented at Suckness next year. And mm -hmm. come up with a really rich expression of exactly what Greg just said. Expressed by the kids themselves to the extent we can. And have that as a, as a, a theme. Uh, or certainly a center point within the Sockness activity to uh, show the rest of the attendees the value to, to a group such as what you represent in, in, in that two-dimension future, preparing to migrate, but also preparing to resilient as mm -hmm. long as possible. And let me ask you to think about that, Scott. We're running out of time here, so we won't have time to develop it on the show. But next time you're back, we'll sit here and lay out what that, what that program looks like. Will do. And uh, so, Scott? Paul, thanks for coming on Thank all you. the way from Ebay. Greg Nakano from Sir. all the way from Manoa. Thanks for coming on, and Jeldon, we'll see you again. And Mayor, thanks for coming over. Not here at the show, but uh, around town. We'll see you all in two weeks, folks. <laughs>